whoever you are, wherever you may be, this is a story for you, for all men endowed with the spirit of a vagabond. On our vagabond journey, we'll take you along the Pacific Coast Highway of Mexico. Now, if you were to look at the pictures you're going to see without sound, you'd surely think that you're visiting some part of Africa, Hawaii, or the interior of South America. Actually, we're going no farther than a few hours by plane or a couple of days by automobile from the United States borderline. Now, we'll visit several ancient cities, inspect many of the historic sites, and then meet some interesting people such as Jungle Jim. He'll be our guide on a river ride to the wild and wonderful jungle, though it may look dangerous, it really isn't if you do it the right way. And during our trip, we'll explain how you and your family can take this trip for a full vacation or even a weekend or for the rest of your life. If you don't have the vagabond spirit to do this, perhaps we can convince you otherwise. Hi, I'm Bill Burrid, speaking on behalf of everybody that has this spirit of vagabond. Now, you know, we all search for Utopia or Shangri-La. In doing our vagabond stories, we've found many Utopias and Shangri-Las throughout the world. Now, I want to show you a particular one on this story. Mexico, a mas gran país in Spanish, a most wonderful country. In particular, the west coast of Mexico, on the Gulf of California, Mazatlan. This, we call, this west coast highway, the road to Utopia, in a sense. Now, Mazatlan is a wonderful tropical resort, beautiful beaches. It's got everything that you'd want to find anywhere in the world at a reasonable price, a price that would fit uh, my pocketbook or yours. Close to Mazatlan is San Blas, and many people go there to retire for the rest of their lives. So whether it's for a, a, a day or the rest of your life, I think you'll enjoy our story of the Emerald of Nairit on Vagabond. Landing at the Mazatlan Airport, 749 miles south of the United States border, we're ready to begin our vagabond tour of the west coast of Mexico. By plane on Aeronaves de Mexico line, you can fly to this and other parts of Mexico in a matter of hours. Part of our group arriving now, the rest taking a longer but pleasant drive by automobile down the Mexican Pacific Coast Highway. Once off the airplane, you can hop a taxi or take an old-fashioned Surrey ride into the main part of town. While most Americans are accustomed to traveling by plane, train, or automobile, a major means of transportation down here is still the old-fashioned horse or buggy. Located just a few miles south of the Tropic of Cancer, Mazatlan, as I told you, is called the Pearl of the Pacific. Suddenly, you realize this is old Mexico. With a population of over 40,000 people, Mazatlan is really divided into two sections. The main part of the city is where most of the natives live, and which, quite frankly, is by far the poorer neighborhood. Then there's the beach area, always bustling with activity. And as you can see by these catches of marlin and sailfish that Oren Sudtel of Oregon and L.W. Motley of Washington are hauling in that this is really a magnificent spot for big game fishing. Boats are available at all times and at reasonable prices, thanks to the guides and the men down here. Mike Maximum, who operates his own flotilla. Altogether, over 5,000 billfish, such as the marlin and sailfish, are caught off the shores of Mazatlan each year. Marlin average is around 140 pounds, and the sailfish tip the scales about 100 pounds. Each rented boat, such as the one we are cruising on now, catches two of the big uh, fish every trip. Right now, though, instead of big game fishing, we're interested in some of the unusual sights such as these pirate caves, which anyone can see if he cruises out to one of the many nearby islands. In 
every way, this is what world travelers mean when they speak of tropical paradise. Out here on these islands, he who is fascinated by the sea, by the great spectacular mysteries of the animal and plant kingdom of the world below, he also will be enchanted by this Mexican coastline. And as we go from above the water to below it, you'll soon see why so many sea-loving Americans and skin divers come down to this picturesque wonderland. Each coral formation is so different in shape and color that it seems as if they were having some sort of competition between themselves to see which one can garner the most attention. And then drifting and crawling by are the different varieties of fish like the sun star. Or a brittle starfish such as this one, so named because if you pick them up and you're not careful, their legs break off easily. When one tentacle is lost, however, a new one soon grows out to take its place. Here we have some hermit crabs. You can readily see where they get their name. Living in an abandoned shell, they remain here until they outgrow this shell. Then move on, look for a bigger one. Yes, these are just a few of the hundreds of underwater sites which attract so many American skin divers to this location every year. For here at Mazatlan, just a few miles below the Tropic of Cancer, is the nearest and the first real tropical port on the west coast of Mexico. Mazatlan is a strip of land that twists invitingly into the sea, with white beaches sparkling along its delicate sides. Fascinating little islands beckoning along the blue-green waters. The beach is a focal point for all visitors, and it's here that one finds the best hotel resorts, such as the Hotel Playa Mazatlan. Now, in an environment that would cost from $16 to even $100 a day at some places, two persons can stay here for a day for under $10. You can go for a swim in the mammoth-sized pool, or out in the incredibly blue waters of the ocean, already legend among water skiers, skin divers, shell collectors, and big game fishermen. You know, everyone in Mexico seems to have a pet of his own. It can be a, a monkey, such as this one, who is called Pancho Lopez, or a parrot, or even a snake isn't unusual. A little more uh, domesticated and, and playful, though, than a snake, and not nearly as dangerous, is the Cotamundi, which is often referred to as a South American raccoon. Now, our cameraman was intrigued by these animals, almost as much as a member of Walt Disney's staff shooting some of his famous nature pictures. All along the west coast of Mexico, such as here at the Bay of Matanchin, you find one lovely spot after another. In many ways, it reminds you a great deal of the South Pacific Islands, or a trip to Hawaii. Even the natives dress and they fish, Polynesian style. And all this right in our own backyard, as we've explained, just a half a day's flying time from one of the border towns of Mexico, or a couple of days pleasant driving by car from Nogales. What more could anyone ask for, for a vacation or even a permanent residence than this lovely spot? No, this isn't a scene from one of Dorothy Lemour's jungle pictures although it will undoubtedly look that way as we cruise along. This isn't a Hollywood set created by an imaginative designer. This is the real McCoy, a trip up the San Cristobal River, a trip that you and your entire family can take when you come here. And taking it, you'll understand why this 
green, green countryside is called the Emerald of Nayarit. And as long as you have a guide such as our own Jungle Jim, it's perfectly safe. Oh, the mosquitoes may give you a bad time for a while, but you'll really have just one pleasant memory after another. We are stopping here, first at one of the native compounds to grab a bite to eat, visit the banana and the pineapple plantations, and see if we can persuade some of the boys to shinny up a coconut tree, bring down some of that famed, refreshing coconut milk. Just a few natives live on this plantation, which is situated about a third of the way up the nine-mile course of the San Cristobal River. The trip, incidentally, can be made for a very nominal fee for both the boat and the guide, with the cost varying on how far you wish to go. The lush vegetation in this tropical climate, of course, makes it a natural environment for growing some of the world's largest and best pineapples. Luscious as that pineapple looks, though, cameraman Lee Hansen still had his eye on, on some coconut milk. Our boatman graciously volunteers to climb one of the trees. Now, climbing one of these overgrown telephone poles is just as difficult as it looks, especially when you do it as this native does, without the aid of any ropes or spikes or any type of uh, climbing equipment. And then, even when you reach the top, there's still a knack to twisting that nut just right so that the coconut, just like Newton said the apple would do, comes thumping to the ground. Climbing a coconut tree is just like climbing a mountain. It's just as difficult getting down as going up, especially when a horde of red ants hinder you. With the aid of a sharp machete, the coconut is properly opened. When it's green like this, the inside is soft, almost like custard. Makes good eating. The cool, cool coconut milk is actually more watery than milky. And like our famous soft drink in America, here in Mexico, this could very appropriately be called the pause that refreshes. Well, we're halfway up the river. And so far, you've probably seen why many people are spending a few days and even the rest of their lives in this magical land of Mexico. And yet we have even more in store for you in beauty and wonderment in the second half of Vagabond. We're back now on the banks of the San Cristobal River not in the heart of Africa or South America, but practically right in our own backyard on the western shores of Mexico. There can be found here a combination of wilderness and wonderment. In the dense, thick jungle which surrounds you, you see and smell the wildflowers, the orchids, the lilies, and even the wild river lettuce. And the jungle seems to creep like a slow-moving iceberg up to the brink of the riverbank. As mighty as that mass of foliage might be, it can't dam up the persistent, ever-moving river. And then, like a pure diamond on a necklace of sparkling glass, a blue lagoon with crystal clear water comes into view. It's more beautiful, it's, it's alive with the whirling and splattering of a multitude of strange varieties of fish. white in color, graceful in flight, are curious onlookers. The white man isn't a stranger in this land. If he feels that way, it's his own shortcoming, for in this Garden of Eden, there's no demarcation between alien and friend. 
Many times, it's a savage, brutal battleground where the survival of the fittest is the supreme law of the land. But by and large, especially at peaceful cruising moments like this, it isn't a jungle of turbulence, but truly a garden of tranquility. Sometimes it, it's even difficult to distinguish plant life from animal life. Here, we see we live the oneness, the completeness, the undivided unity, not only of man himself, but of man and nature. Our guide, Jungle Jim, and his faithful parrot companion lead the way. It is a strange experience hearing a parrot talk back to you in Spanish. We passed four fishermen who didn't seem to be having much luck, but who also didn't seem to care particularly. They're just as happy with a good siesta as a good catch of fish. In these waters, however, even an amateur doesn't have any trouble getting a full quota. As we approach the grasslands, we're nearing the headwaters of this deep and colorful river. A group of graceful, fast-moving pink flamingos attract our, our attention. A group of other birds follow, some cormorants and then snowy egret. By the suddenness with which they've taken off, it's obvious that they've been frightened by something. Upon closer inspection, we find not a snake in the grass, but a coyote in the underbrush. Apparently as much as a ham as a coyote can be. And upon learning we weren't interested in signing him up as Mexico's answer to Rin Tin Tin, he soon departed looking for greener pastures. We're now nearing the end of our unexcelled nine-mile run. The headwaters of the river is a gigantic spring and also a small compound where we're going to stop shortly before proceeding on to the town of San Blas. One thing which we noted with interest here was the way in which the natives uh, put together their thatched roofs. First, they split the palm fronds with a sharp machete. Now, this is done so that the leaves of the palms, or the gullies, so to speak, will all run in the same direction. Thus, slanted downward and matted quite thickly, they're tied onto the beams of the roof, making it cool in the heat and dry during the rainy season. It was from this port that Father Kino in 1683 and Fray Junipero Serra in 1768 sailed farther northward to make their great explorations in California and the great Southwest Empire of the United States. Still standing but quite useless is the old lighthouse from here, the natives first spotted the Spanish and Portuguese explorers, the Chinese pirates, and in later years, the broad, expansive sails of the Yankee clippers. Those days are gone forever for the seagoing men of San Blas. Today, they confine their activities to small craft loaded with coconuts, pineapples, and bananas. Of course, their fishing vessels can be rented by the tourists reasonably at any time. The less than 2,000 permanent inhabitants who live here have little use now for the old warehouse or customs buildings. And unfortunately, they don't realize that their oldest buildings are really their most treasured ones. They don't desire to preserve them. They're content to let them rot in the tropical sun and the teeming rain. On the subject of rain and weather, if you intend to, to take this trip to San Blas or any of the many numerous Mexican cities and villages, the various points of interest which we're pointing out on our Road to Utopia story, we suggest that you travel here any time between November and May. June to November are equally good months. The period from July to October is mainly for those who wish to experience the roaring tropics at its best, including a maximum of heavy rain, thunderstorms, and some exceptionally hot weather.
Our final stopping place at San Blas is the hill which overlooks the entire harbor. On top now stands the old ruins of the original church and fort, completely abandoned and useless. What tales could this cannon tell? The story of a city originally started here. With the passage of time, however, the water subsided and the people gradually migrated into the fertile valley below. They haven't even bothered to preserve the old church, which is slowly being literally strangled to death by the strong roots and grasping vines of the strangler fig trees and plants which are growing here. A few iwana on the crumbling walls are the only signs of life left here. On a more hopeful note, it was about this place, to the bells of San Blas, which the immortal Henry Wadsworth Longfellow dedicated his last poem. What say the bells of San Blas to the ships that southward pass from the harbor of Mazatlan? They are a voice of the past, of an age that is fading fast. The chapel that once looked down on the little seaport town has crumbled into dust. And on the oaken beams below, the bells swing to and fro, and they're green with mold and rust. O oh, bells of San Blas, in vain ye call back the past again. Oh, bring us back once more the vanished days of yore when the world with faith was filled. The glowing faith of the emerald of Nayarit still shines for those who come here and really try to see it. Well, seeing Mexico is, is a great experience. But you almost have to feel Mexico, the mood, the temple. And so I'd like to have you meet someone from Mexico itself, Senor Alfredo Gayu, the executive vice president of Aeronaves de Mexico. Senor Gayu, uh, as they say in Spanish, bienvenido to Vagabond. Welcome to Vagabond. Gracias. Uh, Senor Gayu, is it hard to travel into Mexico? No hard at all. And, no, and it is not hard to get there. For any American citizen, all what I had to do is to go to a Mexican consulate, and upon presentation of proof of citizenship, they get a permit to go across. Simple as that. Certainly. Now, you hear a lot of stories about uh, living in Mexico reasonably. Are these true? Oh, yes. More and more Americans are retiring in Mexico. A mild weather, a low cost, guarantee a carefree life for limited budget. Well, Senor Guy, you you hear the, the thing spoken so often. Why travel to Mexico? Why so many Americans are going there? Well, in Mexico, we had the slogan, wonderful Mexico has everything, and we mean it. From snow cable canals to tropical resorts, beautiful cities with the modern comfort and the 17th century atmosphere, music, folklore, Mexico, that everybody that goes find it so different, they always come back and they recommend Mexico to their friends. The contrast is so great that uh, there is such a, it's so close at hand, too, that there are people enjoy going there. Certainly. Now, how about Spanish? Do you have to be able to speak it uh, fluently? To be oh, able to no. Everybody will try to speak to you in English and will always try to teach you some Spanish. So when you come back home, you will have something of our beautiful language. I know. Every time we've traveled into uh, Mexico, we learn a little more Spanish, and we hope that uh, we help teach a little more English down there. It's a, it's a grand país, as I said, and uh, that, of course, means a great country. Thank you very much, Senor Gayu. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have an invitation from a man who knows and loves his native country to visit it. I should have said muchísimas gracias, which in my high school Spanish means many thanks. And of course, after hearing Senor Gayu speak and seeing our story, perhaps you too will have a better spirit of a vagabond.